It's my pleasure to present operational research. What exactly is it? Why is it important? And what are some of the enabling factors for operational research? So in other words, the what, why, and how of operational research. So what exactly is operational research? Well, there are many definitions of operational research, but from a health program perspective, it can be defined, or we have defined it, as the search for knowledge on interventions, strategies or tools that can enhance the quality or coverage of health systems and services, or if you like, the performance of health services. Now the term operational research has its historical roots in military and industrial modelling, where it's been defined as the application of advanced analytic methods to help make better decisions. Now again, better decisions about yield, profit or performance. It has been used widely in the military and in the commercial sector. For example, in the military sector, as early as, as, um, as uh, in the Second World War and before, a good example comes from uh, this gun, the anti-aircraft artillery efficiency, this used uh, operational research. A gun such as this one needed about 20,000 rounds of ammunition to bring down an enemy plane in the early 40s. Operational research scientists working on this gun brought down that to about 4,000 rounds of ammunition to bring down an enemy plane. So that's uh, from 20,000 to 4,000 rounds. That's about a five times improvement in yield or performance of this gun. Now it's been used widely in the commercial sector. As early as 1840, it was used, uh, it was operational research used for um, improving the sorting of letters and transport that actually led to England's first penny post. Now, it was exactly this that subsequently was rolled out to the colonies and became known as the Royal Mail Service. Improved scheduling of airline crews. Um, you have pilots flying, uh, you have um, air crews, they keep changing every time they land and take off. That has used uh, operational research. And for those who've been to Disney theme parks, uh, we all know that the lines are very efficient, they have used operational research in ensuring the entries are kept efficient and the exits of people as well are kept efficient. So it's been used widely in the military and commercial sector, however when it comes to the health programme perspective or to health, its application has actually been very limited. Now there are three guiding principles when it comes to setting operational research agendas in the programme setting. The first is you define the programme or the health system objective. You then try to identify constraints to meeting these objectives and you ask research questions around these constraints so that you can address them and meet your health system objectives. Now when it comes to uh, research agendas and the relevant research questions, they can be grouped into three main themes. First, is there a lack of knowledge about an issue? Or is there a lack of a tool or an intervention? Or are the existing tools actually being, being used inefficiently? I'll try to give you two examples now. Uh, on the lack of knowledge and the lack of a tool. Okay, so we'll take up uh, the first theme, which is the lack of knowledge about patients being lost to follow up. Let us assume that the objective in a country X is to achieve an 85% treatment completion rate, for instance for tuberculosis, or excellent retention on therapy for antiretroviral treatment, asthma, smoking cessation tool, or what have you. The constraint you recognise as you implement your programme is that you have a high loss to follow up of up to 30% from therapy. 
And if you have a 30% loss of therapy, the best you can achieve in terms of your treatment completion rate or retention is 70%, assuming there were no deaths. So the research question you might want to ask yourself is why are people being lost? And there may be several reasons for that. It may be because they have to pay for treatment. There may be side effects of the drugs which, you know, put them off. Maybe the transport cost to the clinic is very high because people, the clinics are centralized and people have to travel long distances. Or there might just be unascertained debts or unreported debts you know, adding to losses to follow up. So you try to answer the question in different ways and find solutions to decreasing losses from therapy so that you can achieve your 85% treatment completion rate. Now here's a second example on the inefficient use of a tool and we will take sputum smears for diagnosing pulmonary tuberculosis. Let us again assume that the objective of the National TB Control Program in a country X is to achieve high quality sputum smear diagnosis using three sputum smears per patient, which was the WHO standard guidelines many years ago. But the constraint you realize as you implement three sputum smears is that you realize that three smears per patient are just too demanding for the laboratory technicians because there are shortages of laboratory technicians and massive caseloads. Now, if you were in sub-Saharan Africa, you would also have to do um, stool microscopy, you'll have to do biochemistry and several other uh, tests at the same time. Now, too much of workload. So a uh, relevant research question you could ask yourself is, are two smears as efficient as three smears for diagnosing smear positive pulmonary TB? In other words, maybe we don't need three smears, all we need uh, are two smears. And there have been studies that have shown that two smears are as good as three smears for diagnosing smear positive pulmonary TB, and WHO has actually changed its guidelines. So you could answer the question in a number of different ways. I have now given you two simple examples showing how your identified program constraints can lead you to asking research questions that are relevant to the program. Now when it comes to the research methodology for operational research, they are mostly descriptive or cross-sectional studies, case control studies, but a considerable proportion of them might be cohort studies, which may be prospective or retrospective. The important aspect is that research is conducted within the routine system of care. Now, what is not operational research is basic science research, such as looking at gene types and so on and so forth, and randomized control clinical trials. Now, the RCT is where is a research where, which is conducted in a very strictly controlled environment with inclusion and exclusion criteria, and efficacy is the end point. But the fact that it's mainly done in a very controlled environment means that perhaps the findings may not be applicable in the real world situation. So what we really need is randomized control trials, but we also need operational research and they need to be done in a continuum. The randomized control trial generates high quality knowledge under trial conditions, in fact the highest level of evidence. Operational research then shows you the how to apply that knowledge under real world conditions and if that can be done, patients and communities can benefit from the generated knowledge. Finally, I think it is fair to say that there's a very strong synergy between routine data monitoring and the use of that data for operational research. When you use routine data for operational research, you 
detect many um, um, weaknesses in the data. You realize that there's missing values. You decide there's missing variables. And by doing that, you actually alert the monitoring uh, system to actually improve their collection of data. If you improve the collection of data, that data can be used for more operational research and vice versa. So this synergy is very useful in the program setting. Now that was the what is operational research in a nutshell. I'll now move to the why. Why is operational research relevant? Well, there are three broad reasons. The first is to improve program outcomes. The second is to assess feasibility of new strategies or interventions, be it in specific settings or populations. And the third is to advocate for policy change. I'm going to give you examples of each of these. An example of operational research improving program outcomes is this study conducted in the early 2000s before ART became available in Malawi and the study was voluntary counselling, HIV testing and adjunctive cotrimoxyl showing that it reduced mortality by almost 25% in TB patients in Tiolo district in Malawi published in the journal AIDS. This, along with two other district-level operational research studies, led the Ministry of Health to take a, a policy decision for the countrywide expansion of HIV testing and cotrimoxyl for TB patients. Now, this slide shows you the progress in terms of implementation of those policy guidelines. You will see the HIV testing rates from 2003 to 2010 had gone up from 15% to 88%, and further down you see a high uptake of cotrimoxyl um, uptake. Now, how did that affect the treatment outcomes for TB in smear positive TB? You would see between 2002 and 2010, we had a progressive increase in treatment success, and death rates dropped from 19% to 8%. So fair to say that there was an associated improvement in treatment outcomes with the rollout of cotrimoxyl and HIV testing in Malawi. Now an example of operational research assessing feasibility is this study from Bukavu in the Democratic Republic of Congo which showed um, uh, which provided knowledge on offering HIV AIDS care and ART in chronic conflict settings. Prior to the uh, release of these study findings, the SPHERE guidelines, which is the benchmark guidelines for NGOs um, offering care for displaced populations, actually recommended against the offer of ART. Now, this uh, study helped to reverse those guidelines, and the SPHERE guidelines now actually um, recommend the offer of HIV treatment, including TB treatment, uh, under certain conditions for displaced people. And an example of operational research having wider policy change implications is the various anti-malarial effectiveness studies conducted by MSF and Ministry of Health colleagues in 18 countries around the world, in Africa and Asia that contributed to a shift in both national and international policies for more effective antimalarial treatment, mainly the shift to artemisinin-based combination therapies. Now, I've given you a few examples, but the key elements that you need to remember is that the research questions were always generated by identifying constraints or challenges of implementation, and the answers to these questions should have a direct and practical relevance to solving these problems and improving healthcare delivery. Now that was the why operational research, or why is it relevant? And I'll now try to wrap up with the how. What are some of the enabling factors for operational research in the program setting? 
The first uh, enabling factor is to ensure direct program relevance. And uh, this is because program staff and general health staff are always very busy. And thus you must ensure that the research question that is, that is put forward is relevant to program implementation and very closely connected to health service delivery. Then they would see this as being relevant. And there must always be a coordination mechanism to provide a clear strategy about the setting of research priorities so that the questions uh, or the research that is done uh, actually addresses relevant questions. Now an excellent example, there are many other examples, comes from the Malawi TB control program. Uh, they, set six, they set the objectives over a five-year period. And you have six principal objectives. And for each of those objectives, they try to identify constraints and ask research questions around these constraints. So no one can say within the program or outside that the research questions are not relevant to the program. They're very directly linked to the program objectives. The second enabling factor is really to foster partnership with local programs. And it's fair to say until now that there's been a tendency to outsource research to academic institutions. Now, they're very efficient in producing publications and running high-quality research, but often they set up annex sites. And the research findings, when they're published, are often given to busy program managers who might perceive this as being dumped upon them, and since implementation is not a mandate of academic institutions, uh, often nothing happens to these uh, studies and the findings in terms of implementation because the program managers do not have adequate ownership and responsibility. So what we really need is a paradigm shift uh, to a partnership model that promotes better involvement, co-ownership, and responsibility of the program staff with the researchers. And a key issue is really building the funding and the resources for operational research into a national program. It's fair to say that if foreign or national institutions have all the funding, the time, and the mandate for research, understandably, they also have the associated power of decisions. Thus, bringing the funding into the national programme is key. Again, uh, the Malawi National TB Control Programme is a good example of how you could build a partnership model. You have on your left the international expertise, on the right you have Malawi institutions and NGOs, everyone can put forward research ideas. But the key issue is that a TB programme management group decides on the priorities and steers the research and then implementation can be done by the various groups. A more recent example of a partnership model comes from India and it is linked to the collaborative framework for care and control of tuberculosis and diabetes. Uh, basically what this framework uh, proposed by WHO and the International Union Against TB Lung Disease is to have bidirectional screening. All TB patients must be screened for diabetes mellitus and vice versa. Now, in October 2011, there was a meeting of all the stakeholders, international and national, including all the national programs. They took a decision that in January 2012, they would pilot the screening for diabetes in TB in eight tertiary and 60 peripheral centres all around India. They implemented this as a pilot, and in September 2012, so about a year later, the results were presented back to the stakeholders, who were again called for a stakeholder meeting. And what happened? Well, the Director General of Health Services and the, of the Government of India and the head of the TB division, Central TB division in India, took an immediate decision, again, that same month, in September, to roll out in a phased approach uh, and scale up the screening of all TB patients for diabetes mellitus in the country. And that was published in the Tropical Medicine and International Health 
uh, several months later in May 2013. So actually the policy decision was taken much ahead of the uh, publication milestone. The key message here and the reason why this happened is that the policymakers were engaged right from the beginning throughout the process and with the findings and they had ownership and responsibility of the research study and of the studies and they felt compelled to take uh, a decision. Now that's why it's so important to actually have this sort of approach in the program. Building research capacity and time is very important. It's an enabling factor, and Professor Tony Harris has already spoken about this, so I will not touch this. And he's also spoken about the importance of developing trained researchers as an enabling factor in operational research at the program level. So I will not touch this, but what I really do like to touch and emphasize is the need for a critical mass of research staff within the programs. Uh, you need a competent research officer working within the programs and probably closely with the program manager. This person should be coordinating and helping to set the research priorities and he should be trying to build a critical mass of research staff who work under him. You need to develop or build the practical skills to both conduct and publish research in the program setting. And we need a very strong, proactive way of dissemination of research findings. Now this slide gives you the uh, impact of a critical mass uh, in the, on, on, on publications, which is a scientific standard uh, in medicine and also in research, uh, at the MSF Brussels Operational Centre between 1994 and 2014. You will see in, 90, between 19, in 1994 we had our first publication and each year we had about two to three publications. I went up to about five in 1999 and that is because we had a PhD student who had just published all her research. She then left us and then we went back to one publication, or went down to one publication a year in 2000. At that time, HIV AIDS came in and we began to publish or do operational research in Malawi, in Thailand and in South Africa. And we reached about 15 publications a year between 2001 and 2004. And that is when we introduced a critical mass of support staff, <clears throat> which for us was a research coordinator, a data manager and a medical editor in the medical department. And you can see from the first arrow onwards, there's been an upward trend. Between 2009 and 2010, the second arrow, you notice that we, this is when we started the sorted operational research courses. And of course, we developed much more capacity. And you see there's been an exponential increase in publications in the small unit. And today we publish over 120 publications a year. The fifth enabling factor is really to recognize the role of non-governmental organizations. Now, non-governmental organizations or NGOs can be trouble to programs, but we can also bring them on board. And what we need to recognize distinctly is that they work in conflict settings and with vulnerable groups such as prisoners, commercial sex workers, and, and, and such groups that actually do not have much link to, this, to the routine health system. Uh, thus, this is a way of getting to such populations. The second is by mandate, uh, NGOs such as MSF, Partners in Health, Dignitas, these NGOs are implementers and they thus engage in translating research into policy and practice. And thus, if they do conduct research, they cannot leave the research often, they have to link it to practice and this actually fosters the translation of research into policy and practice. They're in fact obliged to go further. And a practical point is of course that NGOs are well resourced. So they have cars, they have human resources, uh, they have logistics which national programs can use. But what is particularly important about NGOs is their power for advocacy. 
And if they can combine the skills of evidence through operational research with advocacy, they can be very strong catalysts for policy change. Now, this is a study from Kenya which showed that payment for antiretroviral drugs uh, was associated with a much higher rate of patients being lost to follow up than those being offered this treatment free of charge. And the study also showed uh, that many patients who were paying for ART were diluting their treatment. Advocacy outside the parliament. Uh, led by activist associations, led uh, the government to take a policy decision almost overnight to make antiretrovirals free in Bagati Hospital and in the country. This is the MSF scientific website, and it is a very uh, useful way, I think, of uh, disseminating knowledge, uh, having an open repository. Now, on this repository, which you can easily uh, access through Google, uh, we have over a hundred um, journals uh, from 35 publishing houses, and we've negotiated open access for them. This slide shows you actually the impact of that open access strategy, and we've looked at downloads from 2010 of publications from this site. And just taking 2014, um, you would see the upward trend. We've had almost half a million downloads in 2014 from this site, um, roughly 18,000 downloads each month. In 2015, we've had about 25,000 downloads. There are three key, key messages that come out. The first is that the world is interested in operational research and the they get it from this sort of website. Uh, the second is that open access clearly enhances the dissemination process. And third, if people actually read publications coming from an institution such as MSF or any other one, it surely improves its professional credibility as a medical organization. The sixth enabling factor is to regularly evaluate success or not of research. Have the research activities planned, that were planned, have they been completed and published? Has it had any influence on in policy and practice? And if it has, or if it has not, you should provide feedback and disseminate the findings back. Let me conclude by saying that the programme boats, and the boats of health systems in many low- and middle-income countries, have many captains and sailors, but these boats are slow, they are heavy, and as you can see, they lack direction. What we absolutely need to change the social mission of these programs is to have clear direction. We need to have partnership, teamwork, and better performance. And I believe that's exactly what we can achieve through operational research. Thank you very much.